Hi everyone, welcome to this event. Um, we may still have a few people trickling in, but we will start right now. Um, and yeah, my name is Rihanna. This is Mira next to me. Hello. Um, Hi everyone. <laughs> And we set up um, a history of everyone else. So it is a platform really looking to um, share resources, stories, histories, as particularly looking around British colonialism, imperialism, and things that we were perhaps deliberately not taught at school. And um, yeah, our past, uh, our past video was on the history in Jamaica. Today we are switching to India and the East Indian Company. And we are really excited to have Nick Robbins with us and um, Mira will do a bit of an introduction. That. Yes, um, so we really first got in touch with Nick at the beginning of our campaign to remove Clive. Um, you know, after being hugely inspired by the toppling of Edward Colston in Bristol, the removal of the statue of Robert Milligan in Tower Hamlets, um, and also the final fall of Cecil Rhodes in Oxford, we felt that now there was really an energy and an appetite for a real reckoning with Britain's imperial past and, and British Empire. And that starts with, with learning about it. Um, and so we found Nick or Nick found us when we started to organize around moving the statue of Robert Clive from its current pride of place in Whitehall and to a museum. Um, we were lucky enough to, to, to read Nick's book, to learn from Nick at the statue where we did a little teaching. And if you go on our Facebook page, you will be able to watch, watch what we learned. But it was at that point that we had this idea to bring that experience to as many people as we could via an online virtual walking tour. And, and that's how we ended up here. So Nick, it would be brilliant if you could uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, what actually is the East India Company and why is it that you've been so fascinated by it? Well, thanks, uh, Mira. Thanks, Rina. It's really great to, to, to be on this, uh, this event this evening. And I first came in touch with the, the East India Company in the late 1990s, in fact. I was working in Bangladesh. I was working on labour standards in the garment sector, trying to improve conditions, particularly of women workers. And I, and I bumped into this, this, this story about the East India Company, which was very dominant in the story of Bengal, uh, a company from Britain which had come to, come to Bengal, uh, and had dominated the textile and garment sector of, of, of Bengal, um, but actually had very, very visceral reactions with people. So when I asked people about the East India Company, they said, well, this is the, this is the company that chopped off our weaver's thumbs. And I studied history at university, but knew nothing about the East India Company. So this struck me as a big story. And I went to work uh, in, in the city doing responsible investments. I said, well, okay, I'm gonna go walk to the company's headquarters and find out more about it. And I went to the company's headquarters and uh, everything in, it, in England has a plaque or something. And there was nothing there. So there was a strange invisibility. You talk to some ordinary people in Asia, South Asia, China, and you immediately get something and some sort of invisibility in England. So in Britain, so that was the start of the story. So I can, jump in and, and start this tour. You know, yeah, so well, just before you do, actually, I think I want to, I want to hand over to Rihanna to, to, to tell people how they can kind of get involved and how they can ask you questions while you're talking. Right. And I'm going to launch a little poll. Um, so for, for those who have joined on their computers, please do uh, answer. We, we've asked you guys the question, how much do you already know about the East India Company? I want to get a sense of kind of what, what's the existing knowledge in the room. Cool. So yeah, whilst you're um, doing that poll, a lot, a little or nothing at all about the East India Company. Um, yeah, we want to make this interactive for people who are within the Zoom. So please, at any point during the tour, basically Nick is going to walk us through glimpses of um, his walking tour in London. You can chat, you can write your comments on the chat. We will respond to them. If you have questions, we can get them to Nick to kind of respond to during the tour or we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Um, and yeah, we also have a special Q&A button. So if you want to like put a question specifically in there, um, we can see the questions. So you don't need to do it to the whole chat. 
but please do introduce yourself on the chat if you want to and just let us know who's in the room um, and yes the tour will last for about 30 minutes and then we'll go okay here we go so we have the results Mira do you want to have a look <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it looks like most of the people know a little bit um, and actually a surprising amount know a lot. And I think, yeah. Nick, this is something that, that we you mentioned to us that when you've done these walking tours in the past, people do come with a lot of their own knowledge and they're able to kind of share that during the during the event. Um, and then there's a handful who know nothing at all. So this will be brand new to them. Perfect. Um, and I've just been told by someone that attendee chat is disabled, so we'll fix that during the tour so you guys will be able to chat um, whilst Nick goes. But I think at this point we're able to just start the tour. Let's do it. I'm just going to, while we're going, I'm going to have one more poll up yeah. for you to answer at any point, um, which is, do you think the Clive statue should be removed from Whitehall? Um, so given that so many people in the room know a little bit, uh, you know, you might you might know, you might have a view, but what I want to see is whether that changes also by the end. But for now, Nick, over to you to take us uh, through the City of London. So, can you see that lovely slide of those big tall, tall buildings? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, well, thank you, and, and thanks, thanks for the, the, those results, the poll, and particularly the sort of the, the first one about sort of how much did you know. So when when I started um, looking into these things, company and sort of um, and, and really getting trying to get to grips with this 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 story, I knew very very little. In fact, probably nothing uh, nothing at all. So um, the way I've 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 tried to get to understand the company is by walking, is by walking in the city of London. Um, and, and trying to understand uh, the company. Um, and I give uh, walking tours, as Mira said. These are really, I find them great events because walking is a very nice way of, of talking and being in conversation about things, not, 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 not lecturing. Um, and, and, and I learn a lot from those because this is a vast subject, 300 years uh, and so on. And we've only got sort of, I have about half an hour now to go through this. So this will be very, uh, very short, very fragmentary, but I hope it gets, gives you a sort of sense of excitement about this story and how you can engage in it physically, uh, particularly uh, here, here in London. Um, so the result of walking, researching after five years or so uh, was this book, The Corporation That Changed the World, um, which, which I published um, in, in, in 2007, then a sort of second edition in, in 2012, uh, really trying to understand the East India Company, uh, set up in 1600, um, paid its last dividend in 1874, trying to un understand it. And in a sense, there are perhaps two sides to it. One is the sort of uh, very uh, refined, uh, glorious side. This is the company's crest. Uh, this was called the, the greatest corporation in the world by the historian Thomas Macaulay. It was a company whose charter came from the crown. It had a monopoly of all trade uh, with Asia, so a very powerful organization. It would send out bullion to Asia to buy luxuries, which Britain didn't have at the time, spices, then textiles, then tea. It was controlled by its shareholders um, who elected its board of directors, so quite familiar uh, in that sense. But then he had some very special powers, I mean, uh, for which uh, it was given by the crown, the right to have its own uh, army and the right to mint its own coin, and, and in many, many ways actually also uh, dispense with, uh, justice and provide uh, courts and, 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 and so on. So some things familiar to our times, but actually some things really quite different. So that's one side of the, of the East India Company. But then there's another. This is a, a still from the film Taboo, which I think you can see on BBC iPlayer, which is a much darker side to the East India Company. And here we have the other side, which I think particularly com contemporaries of the East India Company really struggled with. The corruption of the East India Company, um, buying off powers, stock market excess, boom and bust, uh, human rights uh, abuse on an epic scale, um, being involved in a famine which killed millions of people's lives. 
and then drug running, the, probably the biggest uh, drug runner in, in, in human history, particularly the open trade with, with, with China. So this was a, a huge company which changed the course of economic history, rerouted the flow of, of wealth, which had traditionally gone from Europe to Asia, from Asia to Europe, first by conquest with its private army uh, in India, uh, and then uh, by the opium trade. Uh, in, in China. What really struck me, and I'll touch on this a little bit as we do the walk, is the reactions of its contemporaries. Um, and so you have Adam Smith, the, the father of uh, liberal economics. He was against the East India Company. You have Edmund Burke, the, the father of modern political conservatism. He was against the East India Company. And then you have Karl Marx, the author of the Communist Manifesto. He was against the East India Company. So if you get the liberal, the conservative, the communist, all from different perspectives, struggling against the, this, this institution. Something was, was interesting, but still I found it very invisible until a friend said, have you looked outside the foreign office? And here we have Robert Clive. And this struck me, and this is where we'll, we'll visit this during the war. This struck me as a very, very strange uh, statue. Robert Clive, um, who was an executive of the East India Company uh, in its army, Clive of India, the victor of the Battle of Plassey, is here outside the Foreign Office to the left, um, and he is probably the, the greatest corporate criminal in British, British history. Why is he standing here outside the Foreign Office? Why is he given this pride of place, as Mira, Mira said? Why is he here? Uh, and that's that really struggled me, and that that really I really struggled with that, uh, and that sort of I think impelled me to to, to write uh, to write this book. So apologies, this is a digital uh, um, digital walk. We won't be feeling the, the, uh, the breeze on our face. We won't be enjoying uh, the walk as we go through, um, but I'm really delighted that Rihanna and the mayor um, and Mira have put this together. So we're gonna be looking uh, at the company's history through these five uh, places. Um, this is a fragment of the company's history. I'm going to touch on things. It's not going to be complete. So please, in the questions, do, do ask uh, questions, do read more, and do do the walks yourself. We're going to start uh, at the pub, uh, the initial story of the company, its initial few years. We're going to move on to the company's headquarters in Leadenhall Street in the city and go through the story of the great acquisition when the company, a shareholder and company, acquired Bengal, the richest province of the Mughal Empire. We'll then move on to the warehouses where the company stored uh, the wealth it brought in from the east. Um, head on to the Royal Exchange near Bank, uh, where we'll talk about the sort of latter part of the company's history, particularly the company's role as the, 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 arch the architect of the opium trades and smuggling into China. And then we'll end at the, at, at, right in, in, in Whitehall uh, with the execution of John Company. John Company, the, the, the nick nickname for this uh, East India Company. Um, and in terms of the story and, and the walk we're going to do this evening, um, we're going to start in the city to the east of London and then move um, to, to, to the west, to Whitehall. And in, and in the, the walk I, I, I give when, when we do it uh, physically, uh, we, take, we take the tube. Um, you can also visit the docks further to the east, which has another part of the company's history. So um, let's head to the pub. So on Fenchurch Street, uh, those of you who know London, you'll see the East India Arms. These you'll see uh, Google Maps um, images throughout this uh, throughout this uh, this tour. Um, and in many ways, you could think, well, this is this just a piece of sort of heritage and has no real role in terms of sort of the reality of history. This is a, a, a street map um, from 1800 and you can see it's a little bit faint um, but on the right hand side you have the India Arms Tavern and then to its left the East India Warehouses. So this is I think really signifying that the company was very much involved in physical trade. Um, it would send out a bullion uh, to, uh, to Asia uh, to buy uh, the goods that it wanted to import in the import export business, bring them back to the docks, and then these would be stored in warehouses across the city like this one here, and then the goods would be uh, auctioned uh, at the quarterly auctions of the uh, East India uh, Company. So where did this all begin? This is, is a map of the East Indies uh, from about, I think, the 1690s. So the East India Company had nothing to do with India at the beginning. It was the East Indies, what we now consider to be uh, Indonesia. And the company was set up in 1600 
um, in England, uh, given the charge by Queen Elizabeth, um, to get to break into the, the spice market, particularly pepper, but also nutmeg and other spices. And England at the time was a very marginal, very poor country and was desperate to break into the, these more sophisticated markets and have access to these really wonderful products, which would enhance uh, the lifestyles of those uh, back in, in England. For the first 150 years or so, so 1600 to about 1750, the co company was really struggling to gain a foothold in these Asian markets, often was bested by the Dutch East India Company, the there were many East India companies, the East English East India Company is only one of those. But really, the, its turning point happened when it started to move into uh, India, into the Mughal Empire. This is a picture of Calcutta, which was one of the company's um, factories or forts, which it, it, it established along the coast of, of India, uh, first uh, in, in Madras, now Chennai, Mumbai, now Mumbai, uh, Bombay, now Mumbai, uh, and, and Calcutta in, 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 in Bengal. And this uh, was the sec company's sort of second great um, sort of commercial success after spices was importing uh, particularly cotton textiles from India, the bandana, the calicos, the shintzes, the dungarees, the ginghams, the muslins, the seersuckers, the taffetas. These created a huge lifestyle revolution uh, in back in Britain, created actually a huge uh, protests as well from local weavers who were protesting against cheap Asian imports and made uh, the company's fortune. The one problem was the company still had to export silver bullion to pay for all these these imports uh, and 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 uh, bengal was known as the sink into which bullion would would flow never to return so one of the company's big uh, challenges was how to send less silver and bullion so we're going to move on now from the pub uh, a little bit uh, north uh, to leadenhall street where the company's headquarters were situated. And this next session, we're going to look at particularly, we're in the 1750s, we're going to look at the great acquisition uh, engineered by um, Robert Clive at the, around the Battle of Plassey, uh, which really sh moved the company into a new uh, stratosphere in terms of power uh, and ability to create uh, wealth for itself, but also create huge human uh, harm. So, we're up uh, in, in Lime Street, looking at this uh, Google view, uh, and you can see uh, on the right there, the uh, Lloyd's building, glamorous uh, modern uh, building, which sits on the site of where the East India Company uh, headquarters were from 1648 to 1858. And so this is what I, I visited when I, I, I went to the city and trying to find uh, sort of a legacy of the company, a physical um, uh, memento or some, 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 some sign that the company existed. This was the first headquarters. Uh, to our eyes, perhaps a quaint building, but actually telling uh, the, 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 the passerby exactly what it is. Big ships, a sailor on the top, fish, uh, and a big stout door on the right-hand side uh, to protect uh, the company's bullion from, from robbers and, and, and so on. So this was the, the company's headquarters until the early part of the 18th century. And inside, this is from the later uh, um, incarnation of the company's headquarters. This is the sales room. The, these, this is really the heart of the company where people come, would come and bid for the textiles and the spices and so on. And the noise of this could be heard um, outside. Uh, and this is where the company would make its money from the goods that it imported um, from Asia. But really, in a sense, the company company was not satisfied and uh, with actually just being a commercial uh, operator. It had uh, a trade uh, agreement with the Mughal Empire to trade, um, but it always wanted to uh, generate uh, more uh, commercial market power for itself and for its executives. Uh, and this is a, is a map of the, the Battle of Plassey, the battle uh, in 23rd, on the 23rd of June 1757, at which uh, Robert Clive famously beat uh, the prince, the Nawab of Bengal, and thereby conquered um, ben Bengal. Um, why did this, this happen? Well, the company was pushing its luck. Um, it, had, it had engaged in tax evasion uh, against uh, the Bengal uh, authorities. It had supported the prince's uh, enemies. And so the Nawab uh, uh, occupied uh, Calcutta. 
uh, and um, and essentially expelled the company from Bengal. The company's share price in uh, in London uh, collapsed, and Robert Clive was sent to restore the company's fortunes, um, and he he won uh, the battle. But really, it was you can better see it, I think, as a business deal. Behind this, uh, the, co the company certainly had, had soldiers and they fought a sort of battle, but he had bribed Mir Jaffa, who was the leading general in the Bengal forces. He had bribed Amir Chand, a leading merchant and financier, perhaps one of history's original Mr. Five Percent, who said he would uh, support the company um, for in return for 5% of the Bengal uh, treasury. Clive was later criticized by Victorians for, for oriental practices of corruption, but corruption really and bribery really lay at the heart of the company's uh, success. Here is uh, Clive on, on the left uh, with Mir Jafar, uh, who he had bribed, and Mir Jafar was gonna be put on the throne uh, and become the new Nawab uh, of, of, of Bengal. Clive was 33 years at the time. Uh, he managed to acquire about uh, 22 million pounds in today's money in terms of the loot that he gained personally. Um, and this start, started a sequence of so-called revolutions where successive princes and, and, and nobles were put on the throne, each giving more and more power uh, to uh, the, the, East, uh, the East India Company. But this was not enough. Here's uh, the real company, uh, Clive's masterstroke. Clive again on the left. This is with the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam, increasingly weak, but still in nominal control of Bengal. And here uh, Shah Alam is granting the Diwani, essentially the, the tax uh, and treasury uh, function of the Bengal state to the company, perhaps the most effective and efficient institution uh, in uh, the subcontinent at the time, and one which would en enable uh, Shah Alam to get the tribute that he would get from, from Bengal. This was a fantastic deal for the East India Company. Clive, when he wrote back to the company directors in London, uh, was describing this um, in, in historic terms. After he had paid the, the Mughal Emperor and other, other expenses, the company had a profit margin of 49%. Essentially now, instead of bullion, uh, the company was paying for Bengal's textiles with its own tax revenues. This was the unrequited trade, like unrequited uh, love. When, uh, when this news hit the London, London markets, uh, there the share price rocketed and, and Clive was very smart in making sure his stockbroker stock broker had bought shares in advance of this, so he profited from the rise. The Gentleman's Magazine, a uh, newspaper at the time, wrote, wrote thus, the prodigious value of these new acquisitions may open to this nation such a mine of wealth as not only to pay off the national debt, take off the land tax, ease the poor of burdensome taxes, but to add to the dividend, the dividend the company paid, as will astonish Europe. But what do you expect would happen if a profit motivated corporation with its own private army took over the inland revenue without any countervailing power? To find out, we're gonna go now further north to Cutler's Gardens, uh, the company, one of the company's um, warehouses. And, and here's, I want, I want to go into this theme of uh, the Bengal uh, bubble. Here's the, here's the street view. Uh, it's still a, a textile uh, area in the, in the east of London. And here on the, the, one of the walls of Cutler's uh, Gardens, a big warehouse complex to the east of, of Liverpool Street, is a, a plaque which was temporarily put up on the walls to try, and, and again, in rather sort of uh, uh, mysterious and rather sort of understated way, tell a little bit about the company's former presence in these warehouses. So these words on the outside are, are taken actually from a poem by John Macefield, who visited the warehouses in the early 20th century. I'll just read it to you to give a sense of where this all came from. He is, he is sending a, his thanks to the owners of the warehouse for allowing him to visit it. And this is his thank you letter. You showed me nutmegs and nutmeg husks, ostrich feathers and elephant tusks, hundreds of tons of costly tea packed in wood by the single e and a myriad drugs which disagree. Cinnamon, myrrh, and mace you showed, golden, golden paradise birds that glowed, and a billion cloves and odorous mount, and choice port wine from a bright glass fount. You showed for a most delightful hour the wealth of the world and London's power. So these warehouses were designed to hold uh, the wealth of the world. And this is, this is really the picture of what it, what happened. If you look, look at these two spikes, this is the company's share price. On, on the left, the far left, you have June 1720. This is the South Sea bubble. But in the middle, you have 
around March uh, 1769, the peak of this bubble is what I call the Bengal bubble. You can, sh you can see on the left hand spike uh, side of that spike, this is the share price surge uh, after the news of Diwani reached the London markets uh, and the shares uh, doubled. But in March 1769, the, the, the market uh, had, a, had a, a tremor, there were disturbances in, in London, uh, in India, sorry, and uh, the share price fell and slid uh, for uh, over the next uh, decade by more than a half. And if you look at the sort of the height of that share price, which obviously that was what most people in London were concerned about, it never really recovered for about 40 years. It took 40 years for the share price uh, to, to recover from this, uh, this uh, collapse. This was a company which had become too big uh, to fail. It was involved now in a credit crunch. It's, it, it had run out of money. It had a stock market crash. And over in Bengal, there was something far worse. There was famine. This is a, a an engraving actually taken from the nineteenth century, the nineteenth century, when there was also uh, terrible famines uh, in India. India is has frequent uh, droughts, but the Mughal Empire had uh, a, a famine relief system. Now Bengal was being controlled by a company uh, who controlled the tax system. Actually, the tax rates were put up when news of the famine arrived. Company executives controlled the grain trade, um, and the uh, the result uh, was was famine, human catastrophe on a huge scale. Um, this this shocked uh, contemporaries uh, in, in England uh, as well uh, as well as um, contemporaries in, in in India. This was a, a terrible uh, disaster that the company had uh, had engineered. Uh, one of the writers at the time, Horace Walpole, wrote this. We have murdered, deposed, plundered, usurped. Nay, what think you of the famine in Bengal in which three millions have perished caused by a monopoly of provisions by the servants of the East Indies? All of this is coming out unless the gold that inspired these horrors can quash them. British rule in India and Bengal began with a famine, the famine of 1769, 1770, and very tragically, sadly, again, ended in famine in the Second World War. As I say, the company was now out of control. The company was seen to be a, a failure at home, uh, collapsing financially and a disaster abroad, uh, inflicting huge human uh, suffering. This is a one of the many cartoons that were that were published during the company's um, lifetime to show uh, to, to to show the, this I think popular concern. This shows Robert Clive on the on the right recoiling in horror at uh, what is described as the ghosts of the black merchants. So these are Indian merchants who have come to haunt Clive, um, to accuse him of, of, the, of the crimes that he has set in motion and to uh, demand justice. Clive actually escaped a censure from the inevitable parliamentary inquiry, declaring himself astounded at his own modesty for not taking more uh, after Plassey. But the company was, as I say, out of control and it needed to be reined in. And there were three measures which Parliament took to rein in this company. First, there was a bailout, the company was bust, and, and the government attached strict controls on the payment of dividends on the company. That was number one. Number two, governance. Again, the company has shown, shown itself to be unable to, to govern itself. So parliamentary appointees were put on the board of Bengal, this, this, this critical province. Uh, and then thirdly, the company was involved in, in importing tea now uh, from China. Uh, and so the third reform was very innocuous. Uh, but had huge uh, ramifications, allowing the company to ship its tea directly in its ships to Britain's American colonies rather than auctioning it at its headquarters in Leadenhall Street. And this stirred up a very flagging protest among the colonists against uh, the UK government's right to put a tax on tea without any representation. Um, in the protests uh, that were that were that were generated against this, um, many of the the, the American uh, patriots used the company's um, a terrible record in in Asia to actually rally uh, people to their cause. Uh, this is one uh, their conduct in Asia for some years past has given simple proof how little the company regards the law of nations, the rights, the liberties, and lives of men. They have sacrificed millions for the sake of gain. So here we have American patriots using the company's uh, human rights abuses in India to rally um, the uh, its supporters for its for its cause. The
The picture here is the Boston Tea Party, 16th of December, 1773, where you have uh, 90,000 pounds in weight of Chinese tea, bought with Indian money, carried in a British ship, dumped in an American harbor by people dressed as so-called Indians. This was a protest against uh, globalization, 18th century style. I want to touch on these two dead white men. Who, who are these people? Why are they relevant uh, for our story? On the, on the left, we have Adam Smith, the Scot, the author of The Wealth of Nations, Wealth of Nations coming out uh, the, the same year as the Declaration of American Independence. Uh, and he saw two things as being particularly against uh, the interests of of human well-being across the globe. First was colonies and the second was corporations. So this, this person who's often seen as a champion of, of the free market was very opposed to corporations, particularly monopoly corporations and particularly corporations that were listed on stock markets such as, such as the East India Company. And he wrote uh, in The Wealth of Nations that negligence and profusion must always prevail more or less in the management of the affairs of such companies. So that's that's Adam on the left. On the right, again, not smiling very much, is we have Edmund Burke, an Irish boy from Dublin who launched impeachment uh, proceedings against the first governor general at Warren Hastings, and he was a conservative. So what, what motivated him was the way the company disrupted, overturned, destroyed tradition and, and order in, in, in India. And he wrote at the end of this life, um, he failed to, to, to in, his, in his bid to impeach uh, Warren Hastings, but he wrote at the end of his life, if Europe ever recovers its civilization, this work of mine will be useful. Remember, remember, remember. So the struggle against the East India Company by people uh, in Britain to try and bring this, this company under control, um, this in many ways uh, failed. The state, British state, was increasingly in controlling the company, but actually um, uh, this was not done with really sort of human interest uh, in mind. We're going to go to the next uh, stage of our walk in the city. We're going to walk um, westwards from Cutler's Gardens down to Bank to uh, the Royal Exchange to really look at the final phase of the company's uh, commercial uh, history. And, and go really into the, uh, the company's history uh, and its involvement in, in drug running and the opium trade. So here we are, this is the, the, old, the old lady of, uh, of Threadneedle Street, the Bank of England uh, facing us. And to our left, just out of, of view, is this statue, the statue of uh, the Duke of Wellington, uh, again, who has a, a part uh, in our story. And I think one of the things that struck me as I've been investigating the story is actually, if you look at the East India Company, it's like a stick of rock and you can get to pretty much anywhere in British history by looking through the East India Company into literature, into fashion, into into, into military affairs uh, and, and so on. And he really symbolizes the Duke of Wellington, the shift from com the company being a, a, a commercial company to one that was increasingly driven by conquest and led by, by aristocrats rather than uh, merchants. In the 1780s, only 7% of the company of India was under company control by the time uh, of the uh, Indian re Great the Rebellion in 1857, it was 60%. So Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, um, was also involved in the, the company's uh, rise in India. And his particular battle was against uh, Tipu Sultan on, on, the, on the right here, the Sultan of, of, of Mysore, known as the terror of, of Leadenhall Street for the way in which he was really one of the few people able to stand up to the East India Company um, and use modern uh, methods of, of military uh, warfare and military technique uh, to stand up to the East India Company. In May 1799, uh, Tipu Sultan's capital, Seringapatam, was captured by the company's forces led by Arthur Wellesley's brother, Richard uh, Wellesley. And if you go to any, uh, many of the Britain's sort of country houses um, owned by uh, National Trust or so on, you'll see some of that loot uh, from the sack of Seringapatam. Uh, in, uh, in many of these country houses. Um, and you'll see some of that also in the Victoria and Albert uh, Museum. Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, uh, was sent into the 
hinterland of Malabar to suppress rebellion. His tactics were very clear. The more deserted villages you burn, the more cattle that are taken off, the better. The people of Malabar are not to be coaxed into submission. Terror will induce them to give up their arms. Um, Wellesley uh, picked up a virulent skin infection called the Malabar itch, which could only be treated with baths of diluted nitric acid. And his reputation from uh, his exploits in India were well known, and, Na and Napoleon called him the Sepoy uh, General. But I want to focus a little bit on in my life, this, this, this part of the walk on tea. Uh, a, uh, here you have a, a, a Chinese uh, tea factory from Canton and now Guangzhou. You see a Western tea uh, merchant down on the, on the left there. Uh, the company had been buying tea uh, from the 1660s, very, very controlled circumstances, only allowed to, to uh, visit uh, China through Canton, through Guangzhou, uh, only for a few months uh, a year. The company was increasingly being stripped of its commercial functioning. Um, it was uh, stripped of its monopoly in, in with India in 1833, in 1813, uh, and then in 1833 it lost its uh, control of trade um, with with China. The company had secured um, the wealth of India by conquest, uh, Battle of Plassey, and subsequently, as, as I've as I've shown. But it still had to uh, ship immense amounts of bullion to China, to, uh, silver bullion to China, to pay for the tea. And tea was available nowhere else in the world at that time. Um, and really, what, what, how could the company, again, like in India, what could the company do to replace uh, this silver bullion? The answer was opium. And here is a wonderful picture of, of two workers carrying a chest of opium uh, made in Patna, the capital of Bihar, uh, to the west of, of Bengal, with the company's chop or, or, or mark, you can see there in, in the middle, UEIC, uh, the United East India uh, Company. Uh, with the conquest of Bengal, the company had access to the Bihar, Bihari uh, opium uh, fields, territories, the best opium growing areas uh, in, in Asia. Um, and these were sold under company monopoly. The smuggling started in the 1780s. Uh, China banned the import of, of opium for, for obvious reasons to try and control uh, drug abuse uh, and, and so on. Uh, and increasingly the company would systematically smuggle uh, opium. Uh, it was sold in Calcutta to private merchants who would then uh, smuggle it into, into China, receive silver, the silver was then deposited uh, in, in Canton, and from this, the company would then buy uh, its tea. When the company lost its uh, monopoly of, of trade with China, it, it, it was the, the opium trade was then led uh, by um, a new range of traders, including Jardine Matheson, whose uh, headquarters in London are at 3, three Lombard Street, just by uh, the Royal uh, Exchange. The Chinese eventually reacted against uh, the huge damage that was being done uh, in terms of health, in terms of economy, uh, to by by the opium trade, uh, prompting the the, the opium uh, wars. When I uh, was 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 exploring this initially, again, my ignorance uh, was such that I thought the opium wars was the Royal Navy stepping in to suppress this illegal trade uh, in drugs. Nothing like it. It was actually the reverse. The Royal uh, Navy and the British uh, forces stepping in to prevent China exercising its right to suppress an illegal uh, trade. Um, this uh, is the, a picture from the Second Opium War from 1857. You have uh, a, a, a steamer sent, uh, destroying the Chinese uh, Navy. Uh, William Jardine, the, the, the founder and, and leader of Jardine Matheson, was incensed that he was uh, seen as uh, an opium smuggler by many uh, in, in the press. And he asserted, that we are not smugglers. It is the Chinese officers who smuggle. And then look at the East India Company, why? The father of all smuggling is the East India Company. By the time uh, the Second Opium War was over, um, Beijing had been uh, sacked. The company itself was no more. And this is going to be the final stop uh, on our tour today, where we cross across town from the city uh, to Whitehall. And we're going to be uh, outside the Foreign Office, outside uh, the Ministry, uh, and looking at the final uh, days of the East India Company. So for those of you who know London, um, here is uh, the picture of the steps known as Clive Steps, 
going up uh, to the Foreign Office on the left and the Treasury uh, on, on the right. And this is the statue that I had never seen before um, I started this uh, exploration uh, many, many uh, years ago. We're now in the 1850s. We're coming towards the, the end of the company. This is a, a cartoon uh, from August 1857 in response to what was then known as the Indian Mutiny, the revolt of the company's uh, Indian uh, troops, often known as the Great Rebellion, and in the 20th century started to be known um, by Indian nationalists as the first great war of Indian uh, independence. The, the, the cause of this, this mutiny, this rebellion, this war, was the increasing sort of separation uh, of the company um, from uh, the Indian uh, population, increasing uh, racism, um, and this, this, uh, this uh, revolt uh, started with fears of conversion to Christianity, um, fears uh, that new rifles had been greased in uh, either cow or pig fat, which were both uh, taboo for uh, Hindus and, and Muslims. It was a terrible uh, fight, terrible um, uh, conflict, um, and uh, one of the techniques which uh, was, was used very often was this technique um, of blowing captured soldiers from the mouths of, of cannons. This has been used by Punch to actually show, I suppose, the, the scorn and, and, and sort of hatred now that the company was now in, that it, it had clearly failed in, in India. So this is the execution of John Company, uh, the nickname for, for, for the company, the blowing up there ought to be in Leadenhall Street. There in the middle, you have the, the final uh, uh, incarnation of the company's headquarters, East India House, and all the charges against the company, avarice, misgovernment, nepotism, supineness. There was a huge outpouring uh, of, of hatred and, 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 uh, and uh, dismay against the company. And this company really was, was on its last legs. It, was, it, needed, it needed to go. Two more uh, dead my, white men for you to, to, to finish up with. On the left, we have John Stuart Mill, who, who I read uh, at university as a great uh, liberal thinker who wrote on liberty uh, and on the subjection of women, known as a great sort of a, a great supporter of, of liberal, uh, liberal uh, values. But he worked for the East India Company for 35 years. Um, and had risen to become a leading executive for the East India Company at the time uh, in, uh, of, the, of the mutiny of the rebellion in 1857. He was an interesting, interesting fellow. And this is what I, I managed to find about how he, he, he acted when he was uh, working in East India House in the city. When particularly inspired, he used to not only strip himself of his coat and waistcoat, but of his trousers and so set to work alternatively striding up and down the room and writing at great speed. So these Victorians were not as stuffy as, as we thought, but he was sent in, sent in by the company uh, in 1857 to ask for a stay of execution to stop the company being wound up. And he argued that the company had uh, won an empire for Britain uh, at the company's own expense with no cost to the British exchequer. Parliament threw it out and uh, in November 1858, uh, the British Raj direct rule uh, under Queen Victoria started. Very importantly, the company's focus was on ensuring the interest of its shareholders um, and dividends continued to be paid until 1874. And then a hundred pounds of shares could be transferred into 200 pounds of cash. So to the end, the, the shareholder interest was pr predominant in, in the company's concern. On the right, we have Karl Marx, um, who was then writing for the New York Tribune. And if any of you want to read his, his journalism, it's, it's very it's excoriating and, and fantastic to read. His um, epigraph on the, on the company um, was this. They do not like, they do not die like heroes, it must be confessed. They have bartered away their power as they came into it, bit by bit in a business-like way. All the company's possessions now shifted east. Three years later, the East India House in the city was knocked down and buildings, um, other buildings put in its place. Um, we, we have a, a lot of the company's uh, artifacts in the Foreign Office um, and also in the Victoria and Albert Museum, in the British Library uh, and so on. And then we have this statue, the statue uh, of, of, of Robert Clive. Now, Clive um, died in, in 1774, as it says there. He died at his own hand. He was a suicide. He's buried in an unmarked grave in Shropshire, where he, he came from. When he died, one of his biographers now says he was the most hated man 
in England. And, and Samuel Johnson suggested that Clive had acquired his fortune by such crimes that his consciousness of them impelled him, impelled him to cut his own throat. This is not a statue that was put up by his contemporaries. It was put up 150 years later, just as the British Empire in India was starting to falter in the early 20th century by uh, Lord Curzon. The Liberal Secretary of State uh, for India, John Morley, who would be in the offices to the left there, actually suggested that a statue to the Indian nationalist hero Garibaldi should be put up instead because Clive had created such trouble. That was put up uh, 150 years after Clive's uh, death, and I think uh, over 100 years after uh, the putting up of this statue, we need to question it. And indeed, uh, in the 2012 edition of my book, I suggested that the statue should be taken down and put in a, in a museum, um, never really thinking that this could happen. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on to just, just this final image, sorry, um, of uh, a piece of, uh, a sort of uh, inventive sculpture, sorry, suggesting uh, a, a way of adjusting uh, Clive's statue with this shadow on the floor of uh, all, the, uh, all the misdeeds that he was associated with in, in India. So you imagine the statue in Whitehall, it would be accompanied by this shadow on the floor um, and that's the end of the walk. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over back to uh, Amaya and Rihanna and, uh, and Mira. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope you're not out of breath like I am. Thank you. Wow. Thank you ever so much, Nick. Wow, yeah, that was really amazing and just so much information. So thank you for sharing. Um, um, and I'm not at all surprised that you're out of breath. <laughs> um, that really was um, a lot, a uh, bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, we have some questions for you, though, so you can't kind of uh, switch off completely. Um, and the first one I'm going to ask is, is from Raisa, who's written in the chat. And she wants to know, were there other corporations at the time or, you know, near that are comparable? You know, there were your other European colonial powers. There was, a, a, you know, a large amount of French colonies, Portuguese colonies, Spanish colonies. Is it, were, is it interesting to compare the East India Company to any other corporations? Nick, you're on. Oh, Nick, you're on. There we go. There we go. Um, so, so yes, I mean, the uh, European sort of colonization imperialism had, had, had many different vehicles, but the corporate, the sort of the company was one of the one of these. Uh, the Portuguese in India set up what they called the Estado do India. So it was a state run thing. The Dutch had an East India company. It was a sort of it was a mixed model shareholders and state. Um, very brutal in Indonesia, uh, very, very poor reputation. The company was used again, again, a chartered corporation by the Crown uh, in the Americas, Virginia, um, the Hudson Bay Company, and so on. So this was a vehicle where essentially uh, the Crown would charter a, a bunch of um, private sector merchants and investors to engage in trade, uh, at, and, uh, and also pursue national interests. Perhaps the Royal Africa Company is another one which has been very much in the news with um, Edward Colston, who is a board member of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Royal Africa Company, a, tra a slaving, slaving company. So it was a very particular vehicle which was used. And there weren't very many of these, these because they had to get a crown charter. They were, they were actually relatively rare vehicles. Um, and the Bank of England was one as well. It was a chartered corporation. Very interesting. And just because you mentioned what, what's it called, the Royal Africa uh, Company, um, Rice has also asked, you know, did the East India Company engage in the slave trade at all? Yeah, it's something I haven't looked at very much, but there was there were there was there was involvement of the company, not in the slave trade between Africa and the Americas. But there was slavery in Asia as well, so it was would, would be engaged in, in that. But it's one of the many avenues of this story, which I, I haven't looked at um, so, so much. But um, yes, I mean, there, 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 are, there are cases of that, but not the sort of the main uh, African uh, slave trade, as far as I know. Interesting. Um, and so I have, there's quite a few questions here, so I can kind of combine two that I see that um, are 
related somehow a little bit. So um, Swasti, I hope I say your name right, um, has asked that they're curious to know when and under what circumstances was the building of the East India Company's headquarters abandoned or ab demolished? So um, yeah, how did it kind of disappear in this way? And, and um, this relates as well, I think, to another question that's come in that says, does more need to be done to recognize the dark past of the East India Company and colonization? How, why? So as you say, there's so much of these buildings have actually been disappeared from our streets and, um, how should we remember this in the UK at least? Yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting one. And I think in a sense, because I mean, actually we, Britain is a culture which is dominated by heritage, but, act, but actually often the, the city of London is very, uns, very, has very little sentimentality to it. So when a building has, has lost its, its purpose, it'll be knocked down and something else will be built in its place. So in, as part of the sort of settlements in 1858, this failed corporation, was essentially nationalized and all the goods uh, that it owned, including its buildings, became part of the sort of state property. And so it was, the, the land was sold off and the building was knocked down in 18, uh, 1861. And so that was, and the company sort of still retains a sort of, a sort of um, zombie-like existence in a couple of offices in the city, simply to administer uh, these, these last payments of dividends until uh, 1874. If you go to Amsterdam, you have the Dutch East India Company, and there the buildings are still there, perhaps because Amsterdam was, was actually less, was maybe a little bit more sentimental, but was less dynamic as a, as, as a city in the 18th century. And it's now part of the uh, University of Amsterdam, so you can visit it okay. in Old Hog Street, Old Hoog, Hoog Street. Uh, okay. Amsterdam. So when COVID is over, somehow we can go visit. <laughs> well, um, Mira, do you have something to say? Well, I, I'm just going to keep, we're, we're getting quite a few questions in. Um, this one, Zenik, is from Salil. Can you tell us about the importance of Surat to the company and how its importance declined once the company got Bombay as a dowry from the House of Braganza? So actually, this is a little out of my depth, of, so you may need to kind of talk us through this a little I think, bit. I think, little, yeah. I think this comes from a Salil who knows a lot about the East India Company. It sounds the like it. <laughs> one of the things. I'm fortunately, Salil, I can't ask that question. I know nothing about Surat. And this is one of the things, this is a, an immense history. And this is why I enjoy these walks so much. You just, you, you could probably tell me about Surat. And, <laughs> and people, when I do these walks, they come with this fantastic, deep, deep information on particular parts of the country. I've looked at it through, I suppose, the window I'm interested in, which is that as a corporation, um, which has some of the things, metabolism that we can recognize, shareholders uh, and, and the sort of the excess on the stock market, actually before it, before Plassey, actually doing maybe a relatively useful job, importing, exporting and so on. So, so that was the window I went in through, but there are many things I don't know. Yeah. So um, that's why if I had been allowed, so panelists weren't allowed to answer that question, I would put answer to the question do I know much about these things I would put a little because I don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> you're right I should have given an option of I know more than more than Nick or I know a, a, other parts of this history very well um, I'm gonna ask a couple more um, while we've got time and this is one I'm really interested in too and it's from Murad is the East India Company shadow still cast over Bengal with how British companies like Primark today mm -hmm. treat garment workers and the garment industry? And, you know, in particular, COVID has exposed um, the working conditions of garment workers both here, but also in Bangladesh. So to what extent is kind of the shadow still very prominent? To what extent does the history you've just told us help us understand the economic system today? Well, I mean, thanks, Mino, for the question. And I'll try to answer this one. I couldn't answer the last one. But I mean, I think that's where it started. I was doing work in, in Bangladesh, trying to improve um, uh, labor standards uh, for, for, for the garment uh, workers. And that's where I first came across uh, the East India Company. Um, and as we know, one of the things which is particularly sort of bearing down and, and, and making a decent livelihoods impossible for garment workers is market power in, in, our, in our society today, market power in the supply chain, whereby 
uh, workers in, in, in Bangladesh and other places have very little ability to actually ensure that their, their rights are, are, are respected and they have decent working conditions and, and so they can uh, live, a, live, a, live a decent life with their, their families. And that was, again, another issue with the East India Company was a, a monopoly, a monopoly of import. Um, so there was constant fighting back in Britain against the East India Company against this monopoly. This is why Adam Smith hated it, because he wanted a more, op more openness. Um, and again, in, in, in Bengal, after Plassey, after the, uh, the, De the acquisition of the Diwani, then the company had, in a sense, free reign because it had the, control it had the resources of the, of the Bengal taxes. It was able to essentially expel the other companies we've talked about, the Dutch, the French and so on, and actually expel other Asian merchants, Armenian merchants and, and so on. So it had total market power and was then able to push down on the, the working conditions of the, the textile weavers in, in India, which actually, when the company joined, had compared with British weavers, had a better situation. So again, it was an exercise in, 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 in market power. And that's where the stories of the weaver's thumbs came up. And again, it's very hard to find evidence of this, but it's a very powerful and horrible image uh, of um, the company and its sort of uh, its henchmen chopping off thumbs. But I find one example of people saying that weavers chopped off their own thumbs to avoid being oppressed and forced to weave and so on. So I think it goes to this issue of market power. Markets can be incredibly useful things. But what we don't want is to have concentrations of market power, which can be used to abuse human rights. Thank you. Um, and I think maybe we can do one more question, if you think, and then because we're all, we're very keen to always end on the time that we're going to say we're ending on. But um, so the final thing we'll ask is one person is asking, um, could you describe the socio-economic background of the men who ran the East India Company? The, who were the shareholders and also then Sam in, in addition to this asks um, is there a sense of the legacy today so maybe families today who are still profiting off some of the money made during that that money and how should that be dealt with so a huge question with short amount of time but yeah yeah so there's some really you know there's really interesting sociology of the East India Company um, of uh, the workers who worked in the docks um, the people who worked at East India House I mean these were from the merchant class so I think I, I suggested that there was a, a shift towards the aristocracy coming in but you had clerks uh, who, who would who would work there and this was a good job uh, you had Charles Lamb, who was a friend of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Coleridge probably actually consuming some of the company's product, the opium, for his poems. And Charles Lamb uh, sitting and working in in East India, uh, East India House. So I think, I mean, it was it was a sort of essentially a middle class op operation. Um, and some of the shareholders in the book, I list some of the shareholders who had shares at the end. These would include uh, Oxford and Cambridge colleges, uh, religious organisations, uh, and so on. Uh, and because the company's shares in 1874 could be exchanged for cash or India government debt, I think that there would be, still be the Indian taxpayer would have been paying essentially the, uh, in the, 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 uh, the descendants of East India Company shareholders in probably up until the independence in, 19, in 1947. So it's a long history, a long, uh, a long shadow. Um, and I, I hope that we can one day sort of actually meet together and uh, go through this walk uh, physically and, and, and wrestle through many of these questions, including ones on Surat. Here's to that. Very much looking forward to that, um, that time and to learn from a lot of the other people that have joined us in the room. We've got to 8 p.m. So I am going to, to, to wrap up. But before I let you all go, um, you know, there are a few calls to action that um, as campaigners, if you if you support us, if you agree, we would love you to, to take. Uh, the first, of course, if you've enjoyed this, then follow us um, at our Facebook page. You know, like Rihanna described at the beginning, our aim is to really center the people in historical narratives who are not usually centered. 
But what I think I love about Nick's talk today is that what we're also not always taught is what some of those dead white men actually said and what they actually thought and who they were actually opposed to. Um, and I think learning that Edmund Burke and Adam Smith were not fans of the East India Company in the way that, that it was run can be a very powerful way of unlearning the histories that were taught. Um, I've sent out the poll again to ask you guys if you think that the Robert Clive statue from Whitehall deserves that pride of place that it currently has. Um, and if you voted that it should be removed, please do head to our change.org petition, sign it um, and tick yes for updates because we've got some cool actions lined up that we would love you to, to be involved in. And for anybody who lives, works, studies in Westminster, we've got a local petition that expires next week and we're desperate to get just 200 or so more signatures on there. Um, and you can read much more about our campaign at, at the bottom here. Um, there's nothing left for me to say except a huge, huge thank you to, to Nick for, for leading us through this walk and spending your time with us. Um, and to all of you for joining. Rihanna, would you like to add anything yeah. else? So obviously massive thank you to Nick as well and to Mira for helping, you know, just facilitate and for everyone else who's come, shared your amazing comments. We'll probably do a follow-up email. A lot of people have said thank you, Nick, and yeah, that they've learned so much as well. Also just a shout out that we are doing another event. This time we are doing it on Hong Kong. It feels like we're just like, we're all over the place, but we're really trying to learn different histories. So on the first Sunday of every month, me and Mira will get together to kind of talk through a history that we've learned that month. And so um, 2nd of August, that Sunday, we'll be talking about Hong Kong 1970s protests. So join us for that. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.